Locked On Seahawks. Your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings, 12s. This is your host for this frigid Blue Friday here in the Pacific Northwest, Nick Lee. I'm here to prep you for the upcoming game against the Detroit Lions as well as dissect some interesting comments made by Seattle's starting quarterback on Thursday, uh, causing some uh, conversation and perhaps some controversy and a conversation certainly to be had uh, about the future of the Seattle Seahawks as an organization. So let's get rolling here on the Friday. Thanks for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen every day. Now for your lead story here on Locked On Seahawks. Russell Wilson spoke with reporters on Thursday and had some interesting quotes that most fans will likely chew on all offseason as, you know, as the fans do, especially as the season winds down and as the Seahawks are eliminated from playoff contention, uh, that uh, offseason chatter probably will start a little bit early. Unfortunately, you never want to see that, but uh, such is life sometimes. And given how the season has gone, you know, five and ten, last place in the NFC West out of the playoffs, first losing season in a decade what are the chances that Russell Wilson comes back next year? And let's open it up also to Pete Carroll. What uh, does does it have to be either or? Does it have to be keep one and lose the other? Do, can both come back? Do both leave? Is it either and neither or both kind of situation here? Um, it doesn't have to be, but let's have that conversation anyway. And I want, I want to talk about what the chances are that that either one leave. And 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 to to speak on those comments. Um, if you're not quite sure what I'm thinking of. Or referring to Russell Wilson spoke with reporters on Thursday and when asked if he believed he could win three championships while staying in Seattle after the team missed the playoffs this season, he said, I hope so. Obviously, we can't do it right now, not being in the playoffs right now. But I think that most importantly, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of things. It takes a lot of pieces. And I think we have a good amount of those pieces, a lot of them. And then he continues and he says, I know for me personally, I hope it's not my last game. But at the same time, I know it won't be my last game in the NFL. I'm just focused on today and getting better today. That's my goal. I love this city and I love this moment. I love these guys and we got to make sure to get better today. That's all that matters. So there could be a lot to unpack there, um, especially when he says, I hope it's not my last game, but at the same time, I know it's not my last game in the NFL. So that would infer that he was saying, I hope this is not my last game in Seattle. And is, is the Seahawks game against the Detroit Lions on Sunday Russell Wilson's final home game as a Seahawk. I think there's a non-zero chance that that is true. Um, I'm not going to say it's 50-50. I'm not going to say, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give my take a little bit later. But I think as the season has gone on, and we, we dealt with it all last, all off season last 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 year. Um, you, you can kind of see the writing on the wall a little bit of maybe not forcing his way out, but. Now that there's, he just hasn't. This has not been a Russell Wilson season. I know it's the injury. I know part of it's the injury. Part of it's rust from coming back from the injury. You know, it's really hard to make a fair assessment of a full season. But the eyeball test. We we all know what I mean by that. Russell Wilson, to to the most part, has not passed the eyeball test that he made. That his standards have made. This has not been a Russell Wilson type season, and he's a sub. Sub 100 passer rating so far this year. He's missed some really, really makeable throws that an average NFL quarterback makes. And we, of course, we know that Russell Wilson can make some of the most amazing throws that no other quarterback, or at least close to no other quarterback, can make in the NFL. But it just hasn't been there at a consistent rate this year. And whether that's the injury, is he checked out of Seattle? And, you know, that's that stuff all worth debating. And certainly, he did not do anything to curb. <laughs> the the rumors or or uh, the chatter with some of those comments he made. Also, a cryptic tweet came out from Doug Baldwin, a former receiver, former teammate of Russell Wilson. Doug Baldwin tweets, quote, I was recently asked about attributes of a winning culture. My answer, selfless effort and accountability. Throw on tape of Ricardo Loquette on special teams and see what I'm talking about. Do what is best for the team and accept being held accountable to that standard. I thought the timing of that tweet was interesting. As, as it came out following Russell Wilson's quote and the storm that came after. Doug Baldwin's certainly not one to, to be afraid of, of speaking his mind. And I think this is a pretty thinly veiled shot at Russell Wilson. I really do. 
Um, and I, I think most players, current and former, back Pete Carroll. I think that Pete Carroll has a lot of fans in his corner, fans being former players and some of the Seattle media. And and some, of course, did take parting shots at Pete. You know, Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman took parts and parting shots just about everybody. Um, but it, the, the vast majority have bought into his winning culture and produced results. And Russell Wilson has gotten to a Super Bowl. Has now paid, has been paid multiple times elite money, multiple times. Has the superstar wife, the hotshot celebrity life off the field. How hot does Russell Wilson's fire burn to bring another championship to Seattle? And does it burn hotter or as hot as Pete Carroll's does? That that's another question. Because we've seen this all the time. You know, quarterbacks really have that that young hunger and, and get to a Super Bowl and then get paid and never quite reach that pinnacle again. And, and I know it's hard, it's really hard to win the Super Bowl first of all, either way, but I'm just, I'm questioning that. Another question that I want to ask, I'm not going to answer it. I want this is more of a thought provoking discussion here is, is it harder to find a solid franchise head coach or a franchise quarterback? And you know what I mean by franchise, you know, a guy that you can rely on for years, multiple years that you'll always be in contention with that guy at the helm. And I don't know. John Clayton actually sided with the head coach. He said that it is actually harder to find uh, a head, co- a franchise head coach than a franchise quarterback. And John Clayton has been in the, the football media business uh, about as long as my father's been alive. <laughs> so he, he kind of knows what he's talking about. And, you know, when you think about it, you know, teams like the Bears and the Browns have been trying to a- answer that question for years. They maybe have one, but not the other um, or, or neither <laughs> in some cases. <clears throat> Jets. Um, but that, that is the, the Seahawks have had both. They have had a, a solid franchise head coach and a solid franchise quarterback for the better part of a decade. And they got a Super Bowl championship and, you know, almost one more. And, and they've been in contention most of the other years. If they part with one, they need to ask themselves, which will be harder to replace because th- therein lies, I think the decision. And, and I don't think that, I don't think the Seahawks are really saying that, Gonna, I don't think the front office, you know, John Schneider and, and, and the ownership brass, I'm not sure they're going to sit down and say, oh, look, one's got to go. Who's it going to be? I, I don't think they're going to go that route. I really think that this this might evolve organically where Russell Wilson will truly ask for a trade or they will feel like it's time to move on from Pete Carroll and fire him like hundreds of head coaches before him have, have has happened to. Um, but... I also another. I also want to add. You know, Russell Wilson's not wrong when he says there are pieces to to this team to move forward with. And if you keep Russell Wilson, the NFL is really built to be able to reload. It's it's pretty rare in football, I think, to have a multiple year rebuild that succeeds. You know, you see that in baseball with like the Houston Astros. I know there's an asterisk next to that. The Chicago Cubs. You know, they they built it from the bolts and and floorboards up. To a championship in 2016, a baseball it's kind of like turning an aircraft carrier around to rebuild a team. In the NFL, that's not the case. You know, you see the Cincinnati Bengals are a good example. They're they're one of the better teams in the AFC right now. A couple of years ago, they were a doormat, and they have been for a while. Haven't won a playoff game in my lifetime, and that might change this year. So, you keep Russell Wilson, and you have some pieces around him. You know, you, you hit a couple draft picks this coming draft. You sign a couple of free agents that could change the culture and change your fortunes. You know, you, you could make a run at it in 2022. So really, who, who are you going to hit your wagon to? I know that Seahawks Twitter, Seahawks fans in general will probably side with Russell Wilson, the player, over Pete Carroll. I know a lot of people on social media are done with Pete Carroll as head coach. And maybe that's more of the of a factor of his assistance and the decisions he's made with his staff than actually Pete Carroll. I know Pete Carroll has his skeletons in his closet, his flaws, of course. His time management drives me crazy, (laughs) drives me up a wall. His timeout usage, his challenge usage absolutely drives me up a wall. But really, what head coach, maybe this side of Bill, even Bill Belichick's got some weird weird quirks that uh, don't sit right with people. But either way, I think the question is, which is harder to replace? Pete Carroll or a franchise head coach or a franchise quarterback which is harder to replace so if you have to pick one there's your answer whatever answer it is as far as odds go you know 
the odds that both stay for me at this point is about 60%. I, I think it's a bit better than 50-50 that both return for 2022 because, frankly, they're both under contract <laughs> for for 2022. Um, so that's one one side. And, you know, even if Russell Wilson wants a trade, the Seahawks technically don't have to trade him. They have they have him under contract. And then, now that'll be up to Russell Wilson to hold out, whatever, however happens his camp. That's way down the road. But I, I think it's about a 60% chance at this point that both stay. Um, odds that both are gone, 5%, 10%. I think at least one stays. I don't think that's that's – that's you're talking about cleaning house. I think you need to clean house with one of them. <laughs> I think you need to clean if you want to do a total strip rebuild. I still think you need to hold on to one of those guys between Pete Carroll and Russell Wilson. The odds of Russell Wilson gone, I'm going to go 40 percent, a little less than 50 50. I think that there is some merit to him be, wanting to be gone. And the odds of Pete Carroll being gone, I'm going to go 25 percent. You know, flip a coin four times, he's gone once. I think I, I think there's definitely a possibility, but. I'm starting to side with the fact that Pete Carroll has built a culture. Head coaches build culture more so than quarterbacks do. There's obviously very, very, very few uh, exceptions. Like I think Tom Brady has pretty much built the culture in Tampa Bay. That wasn't the case in New England. Bill Belichick did. Um, but it's it's. I, I actually agree with John Clayton. It might be harder to find a franchise, a good franchise, reliable, successful head coach than it is a quarterback. Um, so I don't want to pick sides. I don't want to pick, you know, one or the other. I'm just, I'm giving you odds here and, and just, I want to be asking those questions, you know, what, or who is harder to replace, I think is the ultimate question here. When we come back, I will talk about some keys to victory for the Seahawks over the feisty Detroit Lions. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's the new year, so that means New Year's resolutions. If yours is about getting fit or eating healthier, make sure that you include Built Bar in your plan. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, maybe even better than a candy bar. Built Bar makes it easy to stick to your resolution because it tastes so good you want it, you'll want to eat it. Unlike other protein bars, which can be chalky or waxy or taste like a chemical spill and you kind of have to force your way through it, you want to eat healthy, but it just gets so boring. I, I struggle with that, and, and Built Bars, honestly help me get through um, a, a day where I have the munchies, you know, where you're trying to be, eat healthy, but those cravings come back. A Built Bar is, is a great way to curb that. Like week three, you're thinking, this is just not worth it. Where's the chocolate? <laughs> Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to any candy bar, which usually has around 240 calories, a, a boatload of sugar, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. Here's an idea for the new year. Go to all your secret treat stashes at home, in the pantry, in the office, in the car, wherever you, you stash those goodies. Throw out all the sugar, your calorie-filled treats, and replace them with Built Bars. So you're craving when you're craving a snack or a treat, you can reach for something that's actually healthy and also tastes incredible, just like a candy bar. Even if you're not a huge fan of working out, you can at least eat something that tastes good and is good for you. That way, when you enjoy a delicious Built Bar, you can almost count it as a workout. My personal flavor, favorite flavor is blueberry muffin. I'm a huge muffin guy, and blueberry muffin, the, the flavor, it just tastes so real like a blueberry muffin. is fantastic. My current favorite mid-golf round snack. Welcome back to the Lockdown Seahawks podcast. I'm your host for the day, Nick Lee. Let's go over keys to victory here over the Detroit Lions. And I know that the records will say, well, the Seahawks don't have a much better record, but the, the record will say the Seahawks should win this game. You know, they're, they're at home. They have more wins and less losses than the, than the Lions. So logically, you'd think that they'd be, that they, this should get the job done. But when you look inside the numbers, Dan Campbell's squad, the Lions, have been feisty as heck. They could easily have two or three or four more wins on the board. They have not just been getting plastered like the Jets or the, the Jaguars have been for, for the better part of the season. They have been absolutely competitive and you can see the culture changing before your very eyes with Dan, Dan Campbell. Huge credit to him. I actually think he should be in line for a coach of the year, at least consideration. I really do. I just, you can easily see if you know anything about football, if you're, if you're a knowledgeable football watcher and you watch the Lions there, there, and especially compared to pre Dan Campbell, there's been a change in culture. Absolutely. So the Seahawks need to be on their toes. 
And let's talk offense first. Offensive keys to victory when the Seahawks and Russell Wilson have the ball. My first one is to fight for that extra yard. You know, this is this is we're playing for pride now. You hate to say that. You know, late in December, you're playing for pride, or early January when the game starts, you're playing for pride. You know, play for the 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 you know the team on the on the front of your jersey. Play for the city. You know, that means you're out of it, and which stinks. But the Lions lead the NFL in missed tackles. So there's going to be some opportunities to get chunks of yards. Maybe that that short pass on first and 10, it was originally going to be tackled for second and six. Maybe it turns into second and two because of a missed tackle. So fight for those extra yards. Keep yourself on schedule. And I, I think that the Seahawks offense will be in a good spot. Number two, punch it in for seven in the red zone and then force three on, on the defensive side. The, the disparity on red zone is, is pretty striking, actually. The Seahawks have a decently solid red zone offense. They're actually seventh in the red zone, and I'm talking turning red zone trips into touchdowns. The Seahawks are seventh in the NFL in efficiency in that, and the Lions defense is 30th out of 32 teams as far as not allowing touchdowns in the red zone. So there's some big disparity there. So when you get in the red zone, cash in with seven. Number three, don't get hung up on the deep ball. You know, patience in the pass game. The Lions are 30th in pass rush win rate. So they're, they're not going to be, you know, they shouldn't be harassing Russell Wilson all day long. There should be some opportunities for Russell Wilson to be patient in the pass game. And when you're when you have time in the pocket, not just deep throws, stuff crossing in between the mid mid game, stuff opens up. That as good as any secondary is, you can only cover for so long, especially when you have guys named Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf and Gerald Everett also has emerged as, as a solid weapon. And so just be patient. Things will open up and, and also make sure, you know, that, that the 30th ranked pass rush win rate team, the Lions, look like that <laughs> with some solid protection to in order for things to open up. And, and flipping on the defensive side, don't don't even bend. So enough of this bend, don't break nonsense. Don't even bend with this offense. The Lions are the worst red zone offense in the NFL. So you shouldn't really even be letting them get near the red zone. But if you do, you're, you're, you better be you better be stuffing them. They're, this is literally the worst red zone offense in the league. There's no excuse to let the Norse down the field and score touchdowns on you. And then secondly, you know, as far at least recording this podcast late Thursday night, um, Jared Goff is probably not going to play. He's, he's dealing with a knee injury, I believe, fresh off the COVID list. So Tim Boyle is going to get another start. And Tim Boyle's not going to beat you. He's just not. Make him. Make him try, at least. <laughs> uh, DeAndre Swift, look, uh, running back, looks to be returning. He's been out since Thanksgiving. He was actually coming off of back-to-back 130-yard performances before the before being, going down early in that Thanksgiving game. And so he, he's going to be revving to go. I don't know if he's going to be on a pitch count, but he's a solid, solid running back. Another guy that I'm a little bit biased to, Jamal Williams. BYU's all-time leading rusher is the other running back for the Lions. Offers a really quality, offers depth. He fights for that extra yard, never fumbles. So he's, I think he believe he, he now holds the NFL record for most touches without a fumble, which I recently, I think was snapped, but he, he still holds it. So uh, solid running back tandem for the Lions. Stuff the run. Stop them. Make Tim Boyle. And if you're asking who's that exactly, <laughs> stop him. <laughs> Make him beat you. And lastly, get four sacks. The Lions are 0-3-1 when allowing at least four sacks. They are the 20th ranked pass rush or pass blocking win rate team. So they're they're in the bottom third of the league as far as protecting the quarterback. So you got to take advantage when you can. And, you know, the Rasheem Green, Daryl Taylor, those guys, Carlos Dunlap has come into his, not into his own. He's been in his own for many, many years, but has really come on strong lately and making a late surge after kind of a lull to start the year. Um, so I think the Seahawks are not peaking at pass rush, but they've been really, really solid the last few weeks. I'm really liking what I see from Machine Green. And I, I think that this is a guy that I, I keep reiterating. We almost, when Corbin and I were talking before the year on, you know, who, who's going to go, who's going to get cut, who's going to be on this roster to start the year, we both kind of agreed Rasheem Green was a fringe roster player at best. And now he's one of your better pass rushers, especially on the interior so good for him. I, I think that this is a game where you can see him getting a sack. You know, this, this is a game, I, I think, with, as a whole, they can get multiple sacks, three, four sacks. And that magic number seems to be four 
for for really really flustering this offense because they are actually winless when you get four sacks. When we come back, I will discuss the some picks to click on offense and defense, and also give my game score prediction for this game on Sunday afternoon at Lumen Field. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Bet Online has you covered this holiday season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football continues to march through college bowl season and the pro football playoffs. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. Head into the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code LOCKED ON to receive your bonus. For basketball, football, NHL, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports. So don't wait to take advantage of all the new amazing offers available. Bet online where the game starts. Welcome back to the Locked On Seahawks podcast. I'm your host for this Blue Friday, the snowy Blue Friday, if you're local <laughs> here on a Friday. This is Nick Lee. Let's talk picks to click now. So the game this after or this Sunday afternoon at Lumen Field between the Seahawks and the Lions, which players are going to stick out and who I pick will click on the field and produce a, a, a uh, worthy of picks to click performance. So we'll do one offense, one defense, and then at the end, I'll give my game score prediction how I think this game's going to go. So on offense, I'm going to go with, I'm not going to get cute here. I'm not going to get cute with, you know, the third receiver, you know, Freddie Swain. Or, you know, I'm not going to try to get un under, you know, dive under rocks and try to, you know, search for an obscure one. I'm going to go DK Metcalf. Let's let's not bury the lead here. He needs to show out. I'm not going to go with a, you know, second string tight end. Give it to your dog. He is your dog. He's your playmaker. Metcalf is chasing. Uh, unfortunately, he's still not at that thousand yard threshold. You'd think with 17 games and how elite he was last year, he'd be long past that, but that's just not the reality of this season. Needs 154 yards in the next two games to reach the thousand yards. Needs some help. I think this is a game where he can get more than half that. I think he can get close to that number in this game uh, if they can, if Russell Wilson and DK Metcalf can connect. You know, I'd love for him to, I'd love to see 100 yards. I'd love to see 100 yards from DK Metcalf in this game because, man, they started off so well against the Bears and with that touchdown, and then he was basically non-existent after that. You'd, you you want to see consistent attention given to DK Metcalf, and so I think that this is a game they're going to realize what happened against the Bears, you'd think, you'd hope, and go his way more often. And I don't want to force the ball to him like like in the Rams game, playoff game last year where that uh, turned into a disaster, but definitely – Look what the Rams do with, with Cooper Cup. Why can't the Seahawks at least do a little bit of that with DK Metcalf? I'm not talking the whole thing because the Rams have a very efficient, talented offense that is just a brilliant. But you'd think, especially with Shane Waldron, who has been in the room game planning to use Cooper Cup as part of the Rams staff, you'd think he'd be able to switch that over to DK Metcalf, and hopefully he can in this game, especially with you got nothing to lose. Just see what he can do with, you know, 10, 11, 12 targets. Just let him, let, let him have it, you know? And on defense, I want another, I want to take another moment here. Jordan Brooks. I, I'm going to, he's my pick to click. And not because he needs to, because he has, he, ha he has shown out all season long. I've been super impressed with him. He is turning into a low key. I don't know how it's low key, but it is a low key, solid first round pick. All of us, just about all of us, kind of scratched our heads at that pick. <laughs> well, oh, linebacker at Texas Tech? Okay. Sure, don't we have a linebacker named Bobby Wagner, who's a future Hall of Famer? And speaking of which, without a future Hall of Famer in, in the same defensive you know, defensive alignment as Jordan Brooks, he would be the team's leading tackler. In fact, he'd be second or first in the NFL if it wasn't for Bobby Wagner. And right now, Jordan Brooks has 155 tackles, which is third in the NFL only Luakon, a linebacker from the Falcons, and Bobby Wagner have more. So you'd think if Bobby Wagner didn't exist, there'd be more tackles for Jordan Brooks. So I would argue that if Bobby Wagner didn't exist, Jordan Brooks would be the current NFL leader in tackles. And that is pretty spectacular. So props, you know, that that is a, that is a feather in the cap to John Schneider, Pete Carroll. They saw the talent, the tackle talent of 
Jordan Brooks, a linebacker, and he is absolutely fulfilling that. And talk about a guy who's ready to take on the mantle of Bobby Wagner. I know Bobby Wagner also kind of made some comments that got people wondering about his future in Seattle. I wouldn't fret too much, honestly. Jordan Brooks is a very solid, very solid Pro Bowl level linebacker. I, I obviously would be so sad if Bobby Wagner left. I think he's got plenty of good football left in him. But as far as an heir apparent, it does not get much better than Jordan Brooks. So props to him. He's my pick to click on defense. I think he's going to get another another solid game and get over 160 tackles. That, that is just incredible from the second linebacker on your team. <laughs> that's that's pretty amazing. And as far as, so, you know, offense, DK Metcalf, defense, Jordan Brooks. And as far as the score and the predictions, I actually like this matchup, especially with the disparity on the execution on third downs and on red zone between the execution that the Seahawks have in the red zone and offense and how good they are on defense and, and flip that for the, for the Lions who are not particularly good in either of those. I think a lot of the games in the NFL are decided by third down conversions and red zone trips, turning those into touchdowns. That, that is, if you want to look at who won the game, I think you look at those two stats and you can probably pick who won nine times out of 10, I would say. So I like the, that matchup for the Seahawks. But like I mentioned at the beginning, give credit to Dan Campbell. I really think he should be at least a finalist or in consideration for coach of the year. I really do. I know that it's kind of laughable seeing that the Lions are way out of contention and more in contention for the first round pick than they are in the playoffs. But I just, you just look at the fight in this team. They, they fight hard. They love their coach. Just look at when they won their first game. Where did Jared Goff go? He ran right to Dan Campbell's arms and pretty much did like a, you know, dirty dancing pose with with Dan Campbell pretty much. I mean, they love their coach and they play hard. And that's a dangerous team to play, especially late in the year when they have less and less to lose. You've been seeing risks that Dan Campbell takes. And I think that he's going to see that, you know, fake punts, going for it on fourth downs, onside kicks. You might see it all against the Seahawks. And the Seahawks absolutely got to be ready. So for that fact, I'm calling this a very close game. I think the Seahawks still do win. Um, but of course, you know, it'll, it'll be competitive and maybe a little nerve wracking because whatever game, what other game do the Seahawks know how to play besides nerve wracking and to give you heartburn, keep the Tums <laughs> close by because this is going to be a nail biter. I really think this is, I mean, the Seahawks are not much better. Let's be honest. And Dan Campbell has these guys playing hard. So, uh, the Seahawks do win a tight one. I'm going to go 24 to 20 Seahawks win. Maybe they need a late touchdown. Maybe the, maybe the lions are leading in the second half. I really do think this team is is on the verge of being very competitive despite Jared Goff at quarterback. And man, if, if they can really find a true franchise quarterback, I don't believe it's Jared Goff. Holy heck, watch out for the Detroit Lions if they can get some pieces because they play hard for Dan Campbell. So I'm, I'm going to go with a, with a close, close Seahawks win here. Thank you again for making the Lockdown Seahawks your first listen every day. Make sure to check out the Ultimate College Football Playoff Preview 2021 local experts, betting advice, and draft analysis. The most com comprehensive college football playoff preview begins is live now. Now make your second listen, Locked on Bets. Your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs, Locked on Bets, hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. You can follow me on Twitter at NickLee51. I promise I'll tweet more about the Seahawks <laughs> as, as, the, as the season goes on. I know I'm heavy BYU and, and Padres too, and I'm kind of all over the place. But I love the Seahawks. I'm, I'm happy to be here. And thank you for listening. I'm really, really wishing you a happy new year, a safe new year, a warm new year, especially if you're around here. It's been pretty frigid. So please stay safe on those roads. Don't travel unless you have to. You know, And, and please use four-wheel drive if you have to go anywhere for real. But thank you again. Happy new year. I hope the Seahawks can kick off the new year with a win on Sunday. And then Corbin and Rob will break it down on Monday. And hopefully they're talking about the, the sixth one of the year. So tune in on Monday after hopefully a Seahawks victory. Thank you very much. Happy New Year once again. Go Hawks.